And for all of you who think that I keep saying that the best car designs are from 30 years ago, this is probably one that will really push home that there is good moments, high moments in design in a company's history that you don't have to look very far back to appreciate. Welcome back. If you've been following this series of my top three designs of different car brands, you'll know that every once in a while, a car will come along within that brand that perfectly captures the essence and the feel of that company and takes it to even higher heights. Today, I'm gonna to be speaking about my top three designs from Mercedes-Benz. Each brand has at least three defining qualities or traits that make it distinct among its competitors. With the Mercedes brand, in my opinion, those three characteristics are number one, the seriousness of the design, number two, precision design and engineering, and number three, high performance genetics. I'll explore these in much more detail as I work through my list of my three greatest designs from Mercedes-Benz. In at number one today is the Mercedes-Benz 300 SLR Uhlenhaut Coupe. Now, if you think the car I reviewed last week, the Rolls-Royce boat tail, was expensive, well this car is gonna make the boat tail seem cheap. If Mercedes was to sell this car, which they won't, but if they did, it would be valued at $100 million. This is the car from Mercedes-Benz that won everything in 1955, everything from the Mille Miglia to the Targa Florio, allowing Mercedes to win the world championship that year, this world sports car championship. It was out of this world handling. It had extreme acceleration. Basically, it was one of the iconic cars of the 1950s. So this winning streak that they'd started in 1955 probably would have continued on into 1956 had it not been for the most horrific auto racing accident in history. As a consequence of this accident, Mercedes-Benz decided to pull out and not continue racing in the 1956 season onwards. The gentleman Rolf Uhlenhaut, or Rudolf Uhlenhaut, decided to modify the SLR and come up with what we call today the Uhlenhaut Coupe. So there are only a couple of them, and no wonder it's so expensive. Look at that front grille opening, totally purposeful design, fairly ovalesque in shape. The Mercedes badge obviously in there for identification, for identity. But apart from that, so clean in the front, nothing too extravagant, nothing too wild. It's just purposeful design, nice oval headlamps, as gorgeous as headlamps have ever been done, I would say, on the front of a car. And then you've got those almost pontoon-esque, pontoon-like fenders that drive off towards the windscreen from the front. Beautiful, voluptuous shapes, almost like a thigh. And then this beautiful bonnet hood in between with what we call a power dome off to the right-hand side of the car that has an intake there, a mesh intake uh, that allows a little bit of the cooling air to get into that part of the car. Then you walk back along the sides of the car, you see those blisters coming off the front wheels to allow for a bit more wheel coverage in that area. Stylistic element perhaps, but still purposeful and elegantly done. And as we come back, you can see that beautiful curved canopy, that beautiful curved windscreen that really pushes the limits of, for sure today, glass technology because we're not allowed, we're not even able to push glass technology to curve that much. But done here makes it look almost jet fighter canopy-like sitting on top of that beautiful fuselage of a car. So as you work your way down the side and you come to where the exhaust pipes are, directly in front of the doors, the gold wing doors, you can see them coming out of the side. Not a allowable position today, but for that era, you could do it. It was a race car technology, short pipes, and the sound out of that was awesome. I mean, loud and awesome. Then you come to what we call the seagull or gold wing doors. Some people call them butterfly doors. 
but what they are is hinged in the middle of the vehicle and allow you a lot of opening space to get in and out of the car. Very important for racing. As you move back, you can see the very uh, basic solution of getting air out of the canopy. You can see the vents on the back just above the rear window. And then again, as they were able to do back in that era, extreme wraparound glass, especially on the rear here. A lovely piece of design. I think what makes this car very spectacular anyways is the proportions. If you sit in this car, you're gonna be aware of a long front bonnet stretching out in front of you. But to sit inside this car is absolutely, I've had the chance once in my life to sit in not exactly this one, just a straight SLR. And it is something that I will never, ever forget. You're sitting in a race car. I mean, there are very, very few cars on the market where you have to straddle the gearbox. That's one of the characteristics of this car that you immediately notice that you've got something very, very mechanical uh, between your legs. Um, special feeling. <laughs> That's what it is, a race car for the road that Uhlenhaut took a level higher and started to influence obviously the other cars that came after it. And regretfully, this car was never raced, but I think it would have been extremely successful from 56 onwards. On to the second car. The next one is a personal favorite of mine, obviously, but this one has extra special meaning to me because apart from the Jaguar E-Type Series 1 fixed head coupe that I saw for the first time in March 1969, this is the second car that really, really made me want to become a car designer. This is the C111. An absolutely unbelievable design for a prototype. Normally prototypes don't look this good. And this car here, if you study it, it still looks incredibly desirable, but in a modern way today. But if you look at it, your first impression is not something that you would ever expect Mercedes-Benz to have done or to do. So what makes this car very special to me is the profile of it because it was developed in-house at Tiddlefingen in, in their wind tunnels. Incredible visibility from inside the vehicle outwards. Very expansive windscreen in the front. And then I think what makes it obviously is that placement of the mid-engine, the rotary at first, the Wankel engine in the, in the mid-engine position. But then what I really love about this car is those flying buttresses on the rear of the car. Complete sports oriented, not solid, pierced, in other words, cut out in there, reduces weight, obviously, but probably also to control a bit the airflow around the flanks of the car. Talking about the flanks, look at those side intakes. No fluff around there, just pure side slices into the car to let the air come in to cool off those, that engine bay area. By dropping the nose fairly quickly, your vision forward gives you a lot better placement and, and knowledge of where you are on the road, on the track, wherever but it just gives you that sense of being in control. So they've done that in a way that's almost extreme, but adds to the character of this car like no other car in that period right there. I think it's absolutely lovely. The color graphics of the front accenting the, the, the air extracting areas that come out from the bonnet, that is absolutely beautiful. Gives it a nice period look of racing cars with a bit of that, that, that body color with a black graphic look. Pop-up headlights, one of the most interesting things I've ever seen in car design that regretfully we don't see today. And then as you go to the back, look how they've actually achieved what we, you'll understand now, tumble home. It's almost extreme in this case. The glass is fixed. They've added a lot of tumble home so that the glass doesn't have to go down into the doors. And so they've managed to give it that kind of increased angle to the canopy area, which makes it look very good, very sporty, obviously less frontal area, less drag when you can lean that angle in. And then almost a minimal shoulder line that goes through the area where the glass comes to the body, where they meet. Typically on a high performance car from Italy, you would see a massive shoulder, voluptuous shoulder in that area. That's not Germanic. They've sort of done more of a, a, a trapezoid or, or a triangular type of front section to the car. One interesting graphic that you really notice on the side of this car 
is the two-tone approach that they've done where they divide the car into two halves by painting the bottom side dark and the top side as we know the C111 in a very very flashy orange but that does a lot to reduce the side bulk of the car the side mass of the car it works here because they've lifted it up so high that you still are able to read the bottom line because it's much higher if it was only a little bit of black that would not be a good thing <laughs> you know i often say that the money shot typically is the uh the, the three-quarter rear it's hard to say on the c111 which is the best view of this car that's probably what attracted me to this car in the very first place when I was 9, 10 years old was the fact that this car looked absolutely stunning, futuristic, cutting edge, innovative when I first laid eyes on it. And to this day, I still feel that same emotion when I look at this car as I did when I first saw it back when I was a young boy. Next one and the last one for today is a car for all of you who think I'm not keeping up with the times, I'm over the hill. And for all of you who think that I keep saying that the best car designs are from 30 years ago back, this is probably one that will really push home that there is good moments, high moments in design in a company's history that you don't have to look very far back to appreciate. This one is the Mercedes-Benz, obviously, S-Class Coupe. So this car for me, if I was going to need a car to get me across the country very quickly and in total luxury and, and comfort, this would be the car that I would drive. But this car for me represents Mercedes at its finest. Why? It's cutting edge electronic technology. It does look at the same time modern and almost timeless. It's a design that I would find hard to improve in. The easiest parts to, the, to improve, to criticize on a car, are typically the front views of a car, not so much the rear view, but the front, because you're looking at headlights, grills, uh, bumper, shapes. Mercedes has done it in an elegant way on here, yet still managed to pull out that sporty look that the S-Class Coupe two-door version should have, and they've done it well. Would not give the car a 10 because of the headlight design, I really don't like the lower edge of the headlight as it comes down diagonally almost and then sweeps up immediately up into the grill. It kind of doesn't sit well with my way of thinking that lines should flow into other lines or actually blend in. And this is a little bit of a jarring aspect. As we move to the side of the car, what you'll immediately notice is a very, very balanced proportion. The car looks great on its wheels. It's a big car. It doesn't appear to be big. In a picture, if you stand next to it, that's when you start to tell and can relate to the size of it, to the bulk of this car. But the clay modelers have done a lot of nice surfacing to this vehicle to bring out that lightness of feeling of the surfaces of this car. Again, we've always spoken, or I've always mentioned the beauty of a flowing line. You take the line off the rear of the headlight and you can just see how it flows back, but it doesn't just flow back. There's an element of acceleration to that line. It's not a pure curve. It's not a straight line, obviously, but it's almost as if we bowed it and pulled the major bending point a little bit towards the end. And that, it gives you the feeling that it's gonna release and pop. That's what adds tension. That's what we mean when we speak about tension in lines. Again, as you see that line come back, it doesn't continue completely to the end, which can or cannot be good. They've done it very well here because it goes from being a very soft surface and gradually develops rearwards to the front from nothing into that crease. And that is beautiful because that makes the line come alive. It's not a constant line with a constant radius. It's something that either accelerates or decelerates. And that's always a very beautiful feature to perform on a car, much like what they've done with the chrome surround also around the glass, the side glass. Thinner in the front, thicker as it goes back. It's giving you a bit of acceleration to that line, visual acceleration, and the car, simply for that reason, starts to look a lot more dynamic, a lot more like it's pushing forward. The other amazing thing on this car that you have to really notice to appreciate, it's there for everybody to see, but from a designer's point of view, it's what makes this car become a real coupe, and that's the absence of the B-pillar. An A-pillar, where the windscreen wraps around in the front, 
Typically in the middle where the door finishes, the rear line of the door, you'll have what we call the beast pillar for the structural integrity of the car. And then you'll have that big fat C pillar in the back. And then as we come around the haunches of this car towards the rear, the first thing you notice is that flush, absolutely flush, integral mounted taillight on this car. Beautifully done, not boring, few angles, a few diversions of lines and things like that but all the lines are moving in a direction, in a certain direction, and then continuing through. I love the design of the rear taillights of this car. I think they work very well. A little bit of that elegance of the chrome bar that goes through the top of the headlight and through the tailgate and around, holds it all together. Very clean back end. You start to get the feeling of a sports car when you look at the vents on the side, which are functional. Thank you, Mercedes-Benz. Two slits on either side, nothing dramatic, nothing huge, but there for purpose. So in conclusion, what do I feel about the S-Class Coupe? I feel it's a modern interpretation of the Mercedes values that I described at the beginning, yet they've done something extra, which is design it in a way that this car will look good for many, 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 many years to come. I think it's potentially qualifiable as a future iconic design from Mercedes-Benz. They don't always get it right, but I think they've absolutely nailed it with the S-Class Coupe. So now let's move to what one of the subscribers has mentioned or suggested, and it's a great one. It's what are the honorable mentions that I can add on to my three favorite designs. Number one, the Mercedes-Benz G-Wagon. My second choice has to be the Mercedes 190E Cosworth. And at number three is the Mercedes-Benz W113. And as we all know it, the 280 SL Pagoda. In conclusion, what do I feel about Mercedes-Benz's current design direction and future approaches to their design? What I've noticed lately with Mercedes-Benz almost a combination of going between boring or simple, but in the boring way almost, to another direction which is a little bit over the top. There's almost a discontinuity of a common design language with Mercedes-Benz at the moment, which I understand is hard to control. They have a lot of models in their range and they want each car to look a little bit distinctive. So at the moment, it's hard for me to say that Mercedes-Benz is going in the right direction. And I don't see that single path, that single road down towards a commonized design language that never has to be boring. It doesn't mean that a common design language creates one look, but there are elements that make it cohesive and it's a family look. And when we say a family look, we mean a family look. Everybody looks like they belong to one family. That is a little bit what's missing today, in my opinion, in the Mercedes-Benz design language. As always, thank you very much for watching this video. I hope you've learned a little bit of what I like. Let me know what you like in the comments below. You'll notice that I look at them all, I put hearts on the ones that I really love, and I put that on the ones that I enjoy reading also. But you'll notice that I'm following you guys. I love reading your comments, be it with me or against me, it doesn't matter. Everybody's opinion is valid. So keep checking down below, putting in your comments, Make sure you subscribe. The only way I can boost the content and the production value is to have you guys subscribe. So we're already at a good number, but we're looking to double it very quickly. And you guys can help me do that. Check into my Instagram, frank.stephenson.official. Look at that and you'll see a lot of correlation between my lifestyle and my professional life. So enjoy that. Subscribe to the YouTube down below and we'll see you again soon in the future.